There was a friendly but naive king who wed a very nasty queen. The king was loved, but the queen was feared. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Nemesis, and this is episode 50. And it's going to be a long episode. Uh, basically, what I'm doing is a fan commentary track for the movie Resident Evil Extinction. So if you are a fan of that movie, um, you're going to hear me rip into it quite a bit, uh, which is a bummer because although uh, I don't really like this movie too much, I do like the director who makes this movie. Uh, his name is Russell McCahey. He is the director of this one. Paul W. S. Anderson wrote it, but Russell McCahey, who directed Highlander uh, back in the 80s, He's actually the director of this film. And he's gone on to do, like, you know, in between, he started off doing, like, I think music videos and did stuff for Duran Duran and a bunch of other talented people, Elton John and stuff. And um, and he got into movies. He did Highlander. And then after that, he kind of became, like, a working director and did a bunch of uh, TV shows and movies and things like that. Popped up here and there. I think he did one of the Scorpion King movies. Like, he's kind of just pops up all over the place, you know, takes work where he gets it. And I think he's a very um, capable director. And I think he's very smart when it comes to decision making and stuff. But unfortunately, uh, he was handing, handed a script by Paul W. S. Anderson, and uh, and that's you know a recipe for disaster, I think, for most people. Um, and because uh, at least Paul Anderson, when he directs his own movies, he can try to make some kind of weird Paul Anderson sense out of it. But when other people are trying to direct his stuff, it it just like his scripts, it doesn't work. And normally, a scriptwriter wouldn't have that much power. But I think Paul was also a producer of these movies. And, uh, you know, was because the first movie was a massive success, I think he had some kind of some influence on it. Some. I don't think a ton. Uh, the producers obviously have a lot of influence, and some of them also uh, came up with things to put in this movie that I think are kind of unnecessary. And then there was also circumstances. This movie had um, a lot of kind of drama behind it in regards to, like, characters that originally were written for the movie that were supposed to be in the movie uh, plot threads from the second movie that they were supposed to continue into this third movie because they originally planned this to be the ending like that Paul Anderson uh, Paul W. Sanderson wanted a trilogy and uh, and he uh, he got one he got two trilogies actually uh, but he came back to direct four five and six but this is uh, the second Resident Evil film because he uh, he directed the first movie and then four five and six but he did not direct Apocalypse which was the last movie um, directed by Alexander Witt and he didn't direct this movie. Uh, this is by Russell McCahey. Uh, but it does have Miljovic returning, Oded Fair. It introduces Allie Larder as Claire. It, bring back, uh, it brings back Dr. Isaac, played by Ian Glynn, uh, at the end of the last movie. Um, and then we get a bunch of new characters. We also get uh, LJ, uh, played by Mike Epps, returns in this movie as well. Um, along with a lot of other returns. <laughs> so so we'll, uh, there's a, a saying in Hollywood, when you make a sequel, they say uh, producers want you to make the same thing but different. And I think with Paul Anderson, he's, he kind of has a different motto. He's like, I'll make the same thing, but for the first time. Uh, because he does a lot of things where it's like, hey, uh, remember the last movie when we did this? Okay, cool. Well, we're not going to touch on that. <laughs> we're going to ignore it. Uh, he's very good at that. And uh, a bigger example you'll see is whenever I get to the commentary track for Resident Evil Afterlife, um, the fourth movie, it contradicts almost everything said in this movie as far as like what the T-Virus does to the planet itself. So it's just, it's really funny. Um, but there is a lot of contradictions. There's a lot of interviews that came out before this movie saying it takes place eight years after the last movie. But in this movie, they clarify that it's five years and not eight years. So there's, there has been discrepancies and things like that from interviews to the final product. And I think that's because they shot it and did it one way. Um, and then of course in editing and stuff, they, it, it came out something different, which typically happens with pretty much every movie in a lot of ways. So, um, so yeah, so buckle in. If you have a copy of the movie, I'll tell you when we're gonna start here. We're gonna start here at like the in a couple, like a minute or so. Um, but get the movie ready and get it. Uh, bring it to the screen, the main screen uh, where it says play movie. And I'm gonna press the button. And or when I tell you to press the button, that's when I press the button. So uh, so we'll we'll try to sync it up. Um, so that way, if there's any like uh, you know screens in front of it saying what it, the rating is and stuff, we'll all get those together. Um, so yeah, just hang on to the main title screen. And uh, hang on to the, you know, he, you know, put your cursor over play movie and just get it ready. And we'll press it in one second. But I just want to say thank you all for being here. For those of you who make through the whole episode, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give as much thoughts of this movie as I can. Uh, I don't think you're going to learn anything new from me if you've already seen the movie. And if you've uh, already seen the movie with the commentary tracks, which I've watched a, a dozen times now. 
Um, I like to learn about filmmaking, even on movies that I don't like, because I want to know why they make the decisions that they make. And this movie is one of those where I'm like, okay, well, they kind of told me why, but I don't understand. I still don't get it. <laughs> like, I don't know why they, I still don't know why at the end of the day, that was the choice they made. Um, but we'll get into all that. We'll get into all those details and stuff while we play the movie. So now that we're at the five minute marker, get ready, put your cursor over play movie. And in three, two, one, press play movie. All right, there we go. And I got the rated R blue screen popped up. So, uh, so yeah, we'll do our best. You know, we'll try to just kind of have fun with this. I'm going to talk off the cuff. I did take a couple notes of things that I just uh, wanted to make sure I didn't forget. Uh, like, for example, there is a novelization of this movie. There's six Resident Evil live action movies written by Paul W.S. Anderson. He directed four of them, like I said. And there's a couple novels. Um, there's five novels, in fact. Uh, the only movie that doesn't have a novel is the fourth movie, Afterlife. There was no novelization of that. Uh, by the way, the movie is just starting now. The red logo is popping up for, uh, I think it's for Screen Gems. Yeah. So uh, that is just says Screen Gems. Sony Picture Entertainment Company. That just popped up. You're going to get a reprieve from the uh, original theme song, but because they didn't get Marco Beltrami or Marilyn Manson back, it's it's like a, a new version of it, and you're just getting hints of it. There's a Constantin Film logo. They're the people who own the rights to Resident Evil, the movie rights. So as uh, long as they're around, they're going to still have their hands in these movies, which is the only reason I'm slightly concerned for the new movie. I think the new movie, by mixing Resident Evil 1 and 2 uh, video game stories, could be interesting, but also could be a big mess in the wrong hands. And I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of faith in Constantin films. I don't personally have a dislike towards any of them. I just, I'm judging that based off these six movies. They just keep making horrible horrible decisions and mistakes <laughs> and, and it, but they were you know hey we made money and it's like oh, do you, but did you make as much as you could have if you had capable people uh, making these movies and I don't want to say like Paul W. Sanderson isn't a capable film director that's not true at all actually I may not like the guy but he is very good about being under budget um, being on time he's very professional he's not like a drama queen um, he you know he compromises he'll he'll talk with you and negotiate things with you and obviously that's kind of a, a person a studio wants to work with and if they make money too that's a bonus so considering how little these movies cost to make you know they're like 40 million dollar budget some of them 50 million dollars um they do make money actually um based on you know having a lower budget and having someone like a paul w sanderson there's a benefit to that um doing those movies uh for doing them under small budgets and the uh, same with russell mckay he's used to doing low budget movies too so this opening here, we're seeing Alice walk into the room. She's tying the robe onto her just so you make sure we're still synced up together and stuff. She's staring at the red dress on the bed. And um, this is obviously a scene from the first movie. This is actual footage from the first movie. And you can kind of tell because of the there's like a weird filter on the film. And I'm thinking that's just because they shot the original movie, I think, in 2001 or something like that. Um, and it had a, a certain film quality to it. And then in... 2004 when Russell McCahey directed this one he decided to shoot it on something else like you know shoot use different cameras he, I don't know if he went digital or what I can't I actually don't know those kind of details but he shot it in a using different uh, equipment I think than Paul W. Sanderson did so there is a stark difference you you'll tell actually the moment you you'll notice it <laughs> it's a uh, it's pretty much right here um like, uh, uh, yeah, it's compl this is all new. So it's uh, Alice walking down the laser hallway, which wouldn't be there. So the, the idea of this is that you're watching this going, wait a minute, I'm, am I in the first movie? What's going on? It's supposed to disorient you. And then now she's walking through and she's getting memories of, um, of what happened in this hallway in the first movie. So now you're starting to see, okay, this, this isn't something else is going on here, <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, you know, it's not, so it's meant to kind of have that reaction to you. Um, for me, it's it, it's just kind of boring <laughs> uh, to to redo that laser hallway thing. Paul Anderson, like I said, he's like, hey, remember when we did this? Okay, cool. And it's like, but he never thinks past that. Um, so it's like I said, he's he's more of a remember this or uh, not the same but different guy. He's a uh, let's make it the same but 
forget that we did it the first time <laughs> you know uh let's make it the same but for the first time it's, it's kind of my catchphrase i came up with for paul w sanderson but now you see that she's in the hospital from the second movie that she woke up in um and you're, we're going to reveal, obviously, here in a second, for those of you who've already seen the movie, uh, you don't care about spoilers, I imagine, <laughs> since you're watching this or listening to this. You've probably already seen the movie. I hope you have. Um, the uh, This moment here where she, like, pushes this gurney down the hallway and it gets sliced in half is, is showing that she remembers even what the previous clone did, which is really interesting from a cloning standpoint. I imagine all the clones are made from one batch of blood from Alice which would be when they uh, captured her at the end of the second movie um, and then at, remember at the end of the second movie when we talked about that in the commentary track she was captured and then they were like you know they erased her memory or something like do you know who you are and she then she had all of her memories um, and she was like no I do remember who I am and now I have superpowers and I have like scanner powers where I can squeeze your head open and or whatever and I kept thinking oh that she must be like veronica uh, not veronica the the uh but like alexia ashford um who is a descendant of veronica for in code veronica and i was like oh maybe she's like got code veronica powers um but then in this movie they don't touch on that at all <laughs> but you see that she just died there so again you're meant to go wait what alice is dead and then it's like oh it's just you know a clone of some kind and now we have this elaborate set where the floor opens up and they're going to bring her up through an elevator and dump her body into a, uh, like a foxhole full of dead clones. Um, it seems like such a waste of resources. Umbrella is this kind of company that just in these movies, I guess you're not mo meant to think about it, but Paul Anderson went so far into the post-apocalyptic world, uh, concept that, uh, I don't know. There, there's too much, like, it's too far into the end of the world to where this company could still run. Now they do explain that a little bit in like a super cheesy fictional way in the sixth movie. They say that this was their plan all along infect the world and all of their investors and, and billionaire friends are going to live underground safely under raccoon city, which doesn't make any sense why it would be in raccoon city. That place got nuked. So even if they were underground, they would be probably, well, I guess if they're very, very far underground, there's a chance, I guess, um, which they, I guess they were far underground, but, um, still it's like, it's just the, I understand you have to have some suspension of disbelief when it comes to these movies, just like you do in the games, but I think the games do a better job of trying to give you some reason why things are there in this movie and these movies just don't really. So we have the a logo that just went by and we're zooming into earth and now we have another intro by Miljovic. This is where Paul Anderson is probably one of the worst when he comes to writing and, and editing and stuff and, and everything. He, he'll he do this cold open, which we just saw with this whole big dramatic open. You're like five, six minutes, seven minutes into the movie, and then you get to a narration, and, and she's going to narrate for like a minute or two, and then she's like, it gets... It's like, can the movie start? Like, can we, you know... And it's like, yeah, technically the movie started... Uh, but this, like, this is her driving on the road. Okay, she's not with her friends from the end of the second movie. You have questions, what's going on? That, that to me, is a better start. It's just her, boom, open road. Um, no monologue, you know, cut all this monologue out. Um, but they, that's the thing with Paul Anderson. He's like, oh, well, we did it in the last movie, so let's do it again. Let's do another, and in, in we did it in Apocalypse. Let's do it again. Let's just keep having these narrations by, you know, Miljovic. And unlike most reviewers, I do say her name properly. Her last name is Jovovich. A lot of people say Jovovich, um, but it's Jovovich. <laughs> so, so, but I, I'll see people who are like, oh, I'm a huge fan of Millie Jovovich. And you're like, well, if you were a huge fan, you wouldn't call her Jovovich. You would say Jovovich. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so she gets this uh, KLKB news radio thing. Uh, she's like, shows Alice out there kind of as a superhero she's like finding people who are in distress and she's trying to help them out but of course it's post-apocalyptic so it, the people she does come across that she is trying to help turn out to be scumbags um you know so i don't know some of this stuff is is neat it's it's um i think this is a neater opening um 
you got all that religious symbolism and these crazy, you know, cannibal type people that have survived somehow out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how they survived out here. <laughs> like, I, I'm sure Mill is going to be the first person they've seen in like a year or two, maybe. <laughs> so, um, I don't, I don't know. But so in the opening, though, Mila's character, Alice, she explains that uh, you know a few years have passed since the Raccoon City incident and the virus didn't stop. Like the government nuked Raccoon City, but the virus didn't stop. Now, that's a big departure from the games. In the games, the nuke that is sent to Raccoon City, it actually does wipe out Raccoon City and stop the spread of the virus. Um, so in the games, it, this is different. Like uh, there's, it's not post-apocalyptic. But Paul Anderson, like I said, he when he makes his movies, he doesn't try to to translate actual Resident Evil stuff in the sense that like, okay, I'm going to follow what was there. And I can kind of respect that. But instead what he does, he follows movies that he just loves, which I, I can't respect that. He's like, oh, I'm going to put in things here from Aliens and Omega Man, and in this case, Mad Max. And you're just like, uh, Resident Evil doesn't need to be like Mad Max. Like it... it you don't have to go that post-apocalyptic and stuff. And uh, it, I don't know. I, I just don't understand the decisions he makes sometimes. Sometimes he just, hey, I get to make another movie? Cool. Um, you know what? I love Mad Max. So why don't I just make my version of Mad Max? And, you know, and it's like uh, Death Race. Like, I think he remade Death Race. And he's like, all right, cool. I'll remake Death Race. And he just, he has all these, like, really weird uh, favorite movies. Um like I, Omega Man's a fine movie. Like I, you know, I don't hate that movie or anything. But it's you know to to make a Resident Evil movie and be like, oh, I'm gonna draw visual inspiration from Omega Man. I'm just kind of like, why? <laughs> like, and then same with this. Like, oh, I'm making a Resident Evil movie. Oh man, we got to make it like Mad Max. It's like, but why? I just don't understand the choices. I guess I'm I'm sure he's convincing in a room when he's like explaining it to people because studio execs like to hear stuff like that they're like oh what you want to make this like mad oh cool mad max people like that movie yeah people know what mad max is and you know it's like it's like he speaks the language of an executive um and then he just does it <laughs> you know like normally you'd speak the language of an, uh, an executive and then you know kind of try to do something different and and you know be like oh it's it's influenced by it but it's you know we're doing our own thing or we're we're it's based more on the game or you know whatever but not paul anderson paul w sanderson will be like hey you remember mad max yeah well there you go i'm doing exactly that <laughs> and so i don't know i i i do pick at the guy but like i said earlier he's a very capable director and uh, he's exactly what a studio wants in a director, which is he's professional. He's a nice guy. Uh, he's hardworking, definitely. Um, and uh, he made them money. And that's re really, at the end of the day, what more can you ask for? Like, the last thing you want is a headache, uh, you know, on your movie. And even though this movie did come with some headaches, which we'll get into here in a second, as Alice is, like, uh, jumping over a rail here and being chased by the dogs, she gets one dog tied up in these electrical wires here and... Yeah, she's like fighting them back. So it's cool to see the dogs again. You know, that's a lot of hard work actually to put the makeup on those dogs. So, um, I mean, I feel bad for the animals, but they actually went out of their way to make sure the the stuff didn't hurt the dogs. There was nothing that no chemicals that would hurt the dogs. And I, I respected that they went that far, considering later in the movies they actually weren't so smart and put actual stunt people's health at risk. And one woman was injured so badly that she lost her arm. And another woman, stunt woman, was killed, and uh, I thought that was, I thought that was really shitty, actually, and and very unfortunate. Um, of course, you know when you're in the stunt business, you know things can go wrong, but in both of those cases, it seemed like they were very avoidable, and yet they still did the the, the stunt anyway and rushed it, and in rushing it, caused a massive mistake, and that's not professional, and that's not good, and um, and that sucks that that went down. So, uh, so now that Mila's running up the wall here, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the differences. I can't remember what thought I thought I was trying to finish before that. <laughs> so hopefully it'll come back to me later. Um, but if you, if, if I ever don't drive my point home on a something, you know, if I like trail off and I forget about it, just let me know in the comments and we'll, and, and I'll answer in the comments. Cause I, I do kind of trail off and forget. Um, and some people ask me real quick, they ask me like, Hey, why don't you do reactions to these movies? And that way you, you know, we could see your face and all that stuff. And I, I want this to be a commentary track. So I, I, this is meant to be played like you can play it on your phone, on YouTube, put some headphones on, 
and then watch the movie on your TV. And you can so you can kind of hear the movie. Maybe you have one earphone off, um, so you can kind of hear the movie and you can hear me. That's kind of why I do this, because uh, that's how I watch movies with fan commentary. I put the movie on my PlayStation 4 like I have now, and then I just have, um, you know, like the, I have the commentary playing on my phone. Um, earlier, I think we saw Mila shoot a zombie, and she said, uh, sorry, Steve. Um, I think the zombie just got run over by <laughs> by the convoy there um, while Anna got a DeVita plays. Which the first time I heard that song, I think, was in a Freddy Krueger movie. Freddy's Dead, maybe. Um, but yeah, so we have the convoy of survivors here. And we're going to talk about them in a second because that plays into the differences between the movie from the script to the finished product. Um, and to the novel, too. We'll talk about the novel a little bit, too. Um, but yeah, so Mila, she shoots a guy named Steve, a zombie named Steve. Um, I think that's a reference to Steve Burnside from, uh, from Resident Evil Code Veronica. Or it could just be a coincidence. We don't know. Steve is not most people's favorite character. But I really like Code Veronica. That's my favorite Resident Evil game. So I hope that's a reference to Steve. But I don't know for sure, to be honest with you. Um, so Mila is out on her own. That's a, a good way to open the movie. She's by herself. And then, boom, you cut to these people. And like, okay, these are the convoy. You have LJ there. You have Carlos. So what separated them? Why are they apart you know it start you start to ask these questions um of course you're supposed to ask questions about the clones too but i felt like uh from a pacing standpoint that's kind of given away too much and showing too much um and it also just is shows the unnecessary <laughs> unbelievable amount of money and resources that the umbrella corporation have even during this hap like it's just crazy to me i'm like they, they were prepared for the entire world to just dry up because the Mila says in the opening she says yeah the plants dried up the water dried up everything died that's what the t-virus did it killed everything living so water plants everything uh and it's funny because in the next movie you see water and plants everywhere oceans are still there icebergs are still there and i'm like i don't understand <laughs> if if everything's gone from the t-virus in the third movie how are they here in the fourth movie um here we have jason omaro playing Wesker. He's the first actor to play Wesker in these movies. Uh, there's a second actor named Sean something. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but he's the Wesker in movies four, five, and six. Um, but we have Jason Amara here uh, playing Wesker, who uh, also, I think, does the voice of Batman in some of the DC animated movies. So, yeah, really awesome. I like Jason Amara, actually. Um, and I like him as Wesker here because he's very cold. Like, uh, he, he's stoic looking and he's cold. Uh, his hair is dyed and it doesn't really look quite like Wesker hair. It's not slicked back. It's like cut short. Um, but his delivery on lines, he, uh, he doesn't, um, over enunciate words, which Sean did. And I didn't mind that with Sean too much. Um, but in the later in four, I didn't mind it too much, but it got a little ridiculous in five and six. <laughs> so, um, so, but we'll talk about those when we get to those movies. So the difference is here. So now that we're in this lab and we're seeing more of the Umbrella Corporation, again, like I said, Paul Anderson pulls from movies. This whole thing with Umbrella being out in the desert and underground uh, is pulled straight out of, uh, Dawn of uh, Day of the Dead. Sorry, the third one, Day of the Dead by George Romero, which uh, featured a group of survivors in an underground missile silo um, and then going up to the surface to snag a zombie or two and then try to you know, educate those zombies, try to get them to act more human or at least cancel their need to eat everybody. Like they were trying to come up with a way like, hey, okay, we, maybe we can't reverse what's happened to them, but maybe we can just stop them from wanting to eat us. And it's uh, actually Day of the Dead's a really great movie. Um, this is not a very good movie. <laughs> this is pulls basically just straight up copies. And that's the thing about Paul W. Anderson. He doesn't just homage things. He just straight up copies them. He copies things from Cube and Omega Man and, uh, and uh, you know, in this case, um, Dawn, Day of the Dead. Like, he just he just copies exactly what the movie did. And you're like, that's not an homage. That's a direct copy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we just had Matthew Mars in there. He plays Slater. He's like the sidekick to, um, to uh, Ian Glenn's Dr. Isaacs. Uh, but he's like the Starscream kind of sidekick. Um, oh, is this Steve? Maybe this is Steve. Yeah, she says, sorry, Steve. So there, there's Steve the zombie. Um, 
but yeah, so uh, he's like the star scream. He's waiting for Dr. Isaacs to fail so that he can become the new head of this facility. Um, so the differences in this movie. When the movie first was written, the plan was to, I believe, have Jill Valentine um, as the head of the convoy. Uh, so it's obviously they wanted Sienna to come back from the second movie. Um, Mila really liked working with her. I guess Paul liked working with her. So they wanted her to come back for the third movie and play Jill again. And she was going to lead the convoy. And then originally they were going to be heading, uh, cause in this movie, this is where, this is the scene where, um, Alice finds a journal, which is very much like from the games, which I kind of liked. And she finds a journal about a guy who was trying to make it to Alaska, um, to a, a sanctuary up there. And, um, and so she's like, so she gets this journal in this scene and she's like, okay, that's where we're going to go. And that's when eventually she meets up with Claire and all them. And they, you know, in this movie, they head up, they want to head up to Alaska to find sanctuary, even though they don't know if it really exists in the original script. They actually did know that it existed because in the original script, Jill was in charge of the convoy and Claire was a member of the convoy. She wasn't in charge of it. Uh, she was a member of the convoy, I, I believe. And she knew that um, the sanctuary in Alaska existed because her brother, Chris, was radioing people. He was the voice on the radio saying, hey, we're up in Alaska. Come find us. So originally, Chris Redfield was rumored to be in this movie or planned to be in this movie. And then I think at one point they changed it and they said, okay, we can't do Chris, but maybe we'll do Leon. And there was even a rumor that Jensen Echols from Supernatural was going to play Leon in this movie. But that was just a rumor. I don't think that actually was a thing or not. So then they changed that. And eventually they couldn't get some of the actors they wanted. They couldn't get the story they wanted. Um, the actress to play Jill. I guess she couldn't come back. Now, I heard rumors that there was a producer or someone that didn't like Sienna and didn't want her back for the movie and thought she was a thought she was bad at acting and a lot of other things, which I think is unfair. Um I thought she did a pretty good job as far as what the character was in the second movie. I just think the second movie was bad and it shouldn't be. N no one really should judge these actors for these movies uh, because they're, they're all kind of bad because the movie's bad. Um, like Mila Jovich is a very talented actress, but I, I can't tell that from the Resident Evil movies, but I can't tell that from her other work. And same with, Sienna and Ali Larder and all these other people, Dead Fair, like they're all great in a lot of movies. They're just mostly not good in these movies because these movies are bad, um, in my opinion. So, so I thought if that's true, if that if someone did dislike Sienna, it's unfair to her. I feel to judge her based on that movie because that movie was terrible. Um, but so we have Claire here with her convoy. Uh, Carlos is up on the top with the binoculars, handing him to LJ now, just so we can make sure we're staying on the same page. And um, because sometimes we'll get audio drifts, and so we might end up at, you know, different times. Sometimes that happens. Um, but so Claire here is in charge of the convoy, and they're kind of just wandering around looking for resources. Now, what I don't like about this movie is that the whole planet dried up. Everything's supposed to be a desert land now, but yet they're driving through, like, Arizona and Northern California and Nevada, which is already desert. I thought that was really lazy. This movie was really supposed to film in the Australian Outback. They couldn't get permits or certain rights or something went wrong. So they end up filming it, you know, here in the U.S., I believe, or, or maybe even some of it in Mexico. Um, but this movie, like, I, I don't understand the creative choice for that. It's like, okay, we're going to have the whole planet dry up. Great. Then make this scene take place in New Hampshire and have the sanctuary be at like Niagara Falls or something like that. You know, do something where it's in a part of the country that isn't desert. That way when people are driving across this landscape, they're not thinking, oh wow, it's just Nevada. <laughs> or hey, that's just Arizona. Like, you know, so I just thought that was weird that they were like, hey, we're gonna make the whole planet desert and then they're gonna drive through a part of the world that's already a desert. It just doesn't make a lot of sense creatively. Um, but so, like I said, uh, Originally, Claire was going to be a part of this convoy, but not the leader of it, I think. And I think it was going to be Jill was the leader. And they were going to be looking for this sanctuary that was run by Chris Redfield. 
but that all went to crap and uh you know they couldn't get sienna back for whatever reason whether it's the the rumor i said earlier about a producer hating her or if it was an actual scheduling conflict i think she was working on a movie called aragon or something like that um so it's possible that could have happened um but uh but in the end you know she comes back in the fourth movie and in the fifth movie so you still get her um but the novel there's a lot of differences in the novel too but let me just wrap up the screenplay real quick uh as lj walks into this room here and does one of the dumbest things that this character can do which is gets bit and then doesn't tell anyone about it which is really awful of him um it doesn't make him a very likable character and i like it, uh, mike epps so I, I and i liked him in the second movie actually as over the top as he was i enjoyed it but in this movie i didn't like him as a character because he he gets bit and doesn't tell everybody i feel like he should have told at least one person so they could keep an eye on him um but uh, so the script, yeah, like I said, uh, it, it went through some changes and then they finally filmed the movie. And then I think even after filming it, uh, they had to make some changes. Uh, I don't know if there was, I'm sure there were some reshoots on this movie. Um, but I think in the editing, they they were able to shuffle around a couple events and scenes. And I think that does affect the pacing and stuff of this movie. Um, and it yeah makes it, uh, <laughs> to the, yeah, I don't know. It's like, this movie has an interesting concept, but it it gets old fast. It's like, oh, you're making a Mad Max Res Evil. That's an interesting concept, I guess. I don't understand why you're doing it, uh, doing it at all. But then this movie just kind of derails and just goes off on a Day of the Dead reference. It's like, make up your mind, Paul Anderson. <laughs> uh, Paul W. S. Anderson. This is a Shanti here, a Shanti who plays Betty, um, made up character for the movie, not from the games. But I do like a Shanti, very pretty lady. Um, and I think a musician, musical artist, a musician, singer, um, and got this role. And, and this is where I, you like her instantly because she's the medic. And so she's naturally a caring person, which the group definitely needs because it looks like they're running low on food and everything. So you want someone to kind of be a rock, you know, and be like, all right, if you get cut or something, I'll help you out. But then for him to sit there and lie and say there's nothing wrong with him and then just to check out her butt, you're like, it's uh, i get it and maybe lj is not supposed to be you know a loved character but i feel like you could like him a little more <laughs> if, if you would have just told her um so this is them uh ian glenn making a super zombie which is straight out of day of the dead like i said and they're going to give him some blocks to try to put into um like a little shape like kids toy like where you have to put a, a square into a square and a circle into a circle and this is straight up ripped off of Day of the Dead. <laughs> like, not even no subtleties. Just full on ripped off. No creative, interesting thing at all. Except they gave him a cell phone and he knows how to operate it. Which, by the way, who's <laughs> who's still providing? I guess there's no uh, service provider for it. This phone's not on, but it's still. But who's running all the towers? And I guess Umbrella is. Like, how are they communicating? How are they doing holograms? Like, whatever. It doesn't matter. Don't read into it, kids. Don't read into it. But yeah, so after the after the script and stuff and all those changes are okay, we gotta we'll bring Claire in. We can't do Chris now. We can't do Leon now. It affected the movie. Uh, you know, I think Paul W. Sanderson had a lot of plans for what he wanted to do because originally, like I said, this was going to be his ending. So I think he wanted to end with all those characters like Jill and Chris and 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 have a happy ending where everyone gets to the sanctuary and it's like, oh wow, we get to see Chris and and Jill and Leon and everyone in a movie before the end and and we get to know that they have a you know they they. They wipe out Umbrella and find peace or whatever the ending was originally going to be. And it turned out to not be that at all. And then this ending just sets up a fourth movie, <laughs> kind of. And then uh, and then the pain never stopped after that. They make four, five, and six, and it just gets just worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, so the novel. So one thing I know a lot of people ask when they watch this movie is where's jill so i just answered that uh they couldn't get the actress back for whatever reason but where's angie angie was the little girl that was at the end of the last movie who was um angela ashford uh which was a code veronica reference uh and she, or alexia ashford is the code veronica character but angie was the movie version where they were like all right we're gonna make her the daughter of the guy who came up with the the t-virus serum but you're gonna see when we talk about the sixth movie 
there, a Dr. Marcus came up with a T virus serum, <laughs> which is more close to the game uh, lore, but uh, but it contradicts the second movie. So again, Paul Anderson's like, hey, let's do the same thing, but for the first time. That's where I got that phrase from, or where I came up with that phrase. Um, and we have Claire here doing something selfless. There's a, a Ashby. Uh, he was actually in. Lyndon Ashby was in Mortal Kombat. He played Luke Cage. Uh, Luke Cage. No, Johnny Cage. Sorry. Luke Cage is a Marvel character. Liu Kang is a different Mar- uh, Mortal Kombat character. But this is uh, Lyndon Ashby, and he plays Chase, uh, who's also made up for the movie, not a video game character. And I love that actor. He's great. He played Johnny Cage in the first Mortal Kombat movie, and he he was awesome, which was also written and directed by Paul W. Sanderson. Um So yeah, then we have um, the so where's Angie? Angie is ah oh man, I, she I guess died. So if you read the novelization, which was by D A and I can't pronounce his last name, he did the novelization for the first movie, the second movie, and the third movie. Um, so he wrote all three of those books. I think he might have come back to do f- the fifth and sixth novels too. I can't remember. I don't know those. I read those each once each. But um, the first three movie novels I've read like three or four times each. So in the novel for the for this movie, the novelization of it, um, you get to learn a little bit more about uh, like there's ba- uh, flashback chapters. So there's this storyline that's like the A story where all the characters are meeting up and everything. And then there's chapters that are flashbacks that show you how like what happened in the past five years. And I don't know if that was based off the original script by Paul Anderson or if that was just the writer of the novels going, these characters are hollow and stupid and I need to come up with a backstory for them. <laughs> so I think, and I'm tend, I tend to believe that it's, that's the option. It was probably the writer of the novel going, this script is terrible. None of these characters are actual people and, uh, or they have like moments of humanity to make them actual people. And then that's it. And so I need to develop a backstory. So the novelist was like, well, where's Angie? And the script doesn't answer it. The script doesn't tell you where the little girl from the second movie was because it doesn't care. Paul Anderson doesn't care about his characters that he creates and, and writes. He doesn't give a crap. Uh, if he can't get the actor back, the character's just gone. And he doesn't really say if they're alive or dead because he likes to keep it ambiguous because who gives a crap? He, he's not about character development or or anything like that. He he just, it's like, okay, I can't use Jill? Fine, I'll, I'll make Claire. And then, oh, I can't use this character? Well, I'll make Claire again, but you have amnesia so that I don't have to rewrite the character. <laughs> so in the fourth movie, she has amnesia. And you're just like, it's it gets so bad. Um, uh, Claire, played by Allie Larder, obviously, who's, who is great. She's actually a good Claire. Um, and super sweet. I think when the fourth movie came out, um, was it the fourth one? I can't remember. Maybe it was this one. Uh, I, I won like a, a trivia. Miljovic and Allie were together at like this smaller convention and they uh, did a trivia and they gave um they gave out like prizes to fans and I got this prize package that had a Resident Evil shirt in it like an action figure of the um of a character from the fifth Resident Evil game the the executioner and then a couple other prizes in there and I think even a copy of the game Resident Evil 5 so uh back when that came out so yeah 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 I um so I felt and, and Ali Larder was the one who handed me that care package because when i won she just was like oh right up there and she walked up and handed me the package and actually the the question she asked me was uh because they did trivia for the fans and the audience and they said they said in the second movie angela ashford was a character but what's that character's real name in the video game and i was the only one to raise their hand i said it's alexia ashford and they're like all right you got it i'm like yeah because code veronica is my favorite game bro of course i got it (laughs) um but so what happened to angie well angie died uh in the flashback chapters from the the novel they show alice joining up with her friends at the end of the second movie like we saw where she gets into the car with lj and uh, oh you know and uh, oded fair carlos um and claire or jill i think it's jill yeah and angie like they all get an suv and they drive off together and they're like alice are you okay and then her eye turns into an umbrella logo because she's controlled by a satellite and she says, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And then they drive off and you're like, oh, wow, what's going to happen? Like, so she's with them, but she's a plant. And, you know, and now Umbrella has control over over Alice. Um, and so that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the flashbacks of that where Alice uses her scanner powers to 
kill everyone in that building or most people in that building and escape. And she's seeing in Glenn's face and then she sees that she has some kind of telekinesis where she's when she's dreaming, she lifted up all those rocks in her motorcycle. A cool scene, but it is one of those things where it's like, ugh. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know, but now she's like, that would alert Umbrella. See, they're like, they because of course they bring the Red Queen back, but they call her the White Queen now. And they're like, hey, we just got a spike. Someone used her powers. And so, yeah, so this is them figuring out that the real Alice is still out there because she's been avoiding them. So, and the reason why she avoided it, so that's the thing in this movie, they don't really tell you why Alice ran away from the group. They just kind of infer, oh, hey, I was under control by Umbrella. And because of that, I had to get away from you guys. And that was the only way you all had a chance to survive because at any moment, if they tracked me, they could turn me against you guys, which it's like, well, even if you're out on your own and they find you, they could also do that. So it's, I don't, I kind of understand her logic, but it does also doesn't make sense. So the novelist, I probably felt the same way. So when he wrote the novel, he said, why is Alice secluding herself? Why does she hate herself so much in this story? Why does she think she has to be alone in the apocalypse? And, uh, and why doesn't she reunite with her friends and try to help them survive? It's because in the novel, Alice kills Angie. Um, they're trying to outrun Umbrella forces, and Umbrella takes control of Alice. And Alice, like, grabs the wheel of the SUV or something and swerves them off the road. They crash. And then when they're sitting there, I think Angie was either killed. And this is the part I can't really remember too well. But I either, either, either Alice shot Angie or in the crash, Angie died. And it was because it was Alice's fault. It was like one of those two things happened. But the little girl was straight up killed. And I remember reading that part in the novel going, wait a minute, what? The little girl's dead? Like, why is it, Why don't they say that in the movie? But Because obviously if Alice killed a little girl that she spent the whole second movie trying to save, it would make her look like a terrible person. So instead, you know, Paul Anderson was like, well, I'm going to just give her an ambiguous reason why she's not around. And I'm going to have no reason why Angie's not around. And that's it. Whereas I think Angie, like their umbrella sitting here trying to clone Alice, like, oh, she, she's bonded with the D, you know, the, the T virus and all this stuff. But I'm like, yeah, but Angie has been living with the T virus her whole life up until she was like 10 years old or whatever in the second movie. So I kept thinking Angie was going to show up in this movie and you were going to see that it, umbrella isn't just experimenting on Alice clones, but maybe there, there was a second experiment where they had Angie. And they had to save Angie. And that's what I kept hoping was going to be in this movie. And uh, and that wasn't the case. Or that Angie was going to, they experimented on her and turned her into, you know, Alexia Ashford, Veronica version, where she's like the, the villain of this movie. And I thought that was like something they were hiding. And because I was like, oh, it's the end. You know, it's, it's the final chapter. Like, you know, they're, maybe they're going to go big. And yeah, they, they didn't. <laughs> Paul Anderson doesn't know how to do that. Um, as you can see, because he actually had his final Resident Evil movie, the final chapter. And it was a, a pile of shit. Like, th- th- that's probably the worst one out of all these movies. Uh, th- that movie literally has no point of existing. It's it's so bad. And it, you're like, this was your big finale? It's so bad. Um, so anyway, so yeah, that's some of the differences between the game, the ga- uh, the, not the games in the movie, but the movie and the original script and then the movie and the novel. Um, so Angie was killed. There's Kmart. Uh, and now we're seeing the crows showing up. And if you see right here, the shot of the crow's eye, you can see it's infected, which is awesome. Such a great effect that they did. And the fact that they had like a bird wrangler there to wrangle at least a few of these crows, um, which I, I can't remember if they actually use crows or not, or if they had to use ravens. I can't remember. One of them's harder to train than the other, so I can't remember. But in the video game, there are infected crows because they were, anytime there's a zombie that dies, gets killed, the crows will descend on them and because they're trash birds as they're called <laughs> in always sunny um if you're an always sunny in philadelphia fan the uh, charlie always calls crows trash birds <laughs> and uh, um i think the i think the crows so they'll come down and they'll just you know pick off the dead bodies like they do if anything's dead any kind of carcass like if it's an animal or a human they'll come down and, and pick off your remains well if they pick off a zombie's, a, a dead human's remains who's infected with T-virus, they become infected. So I, I like that. I think that's really neat. And, and they don't really go into that in the movies at all, but they did kind of say that here. They're like, oh my God, they're all infected. And you're like, oh crap. 
So they have all these crazy birds <laughs> that are infected and um, attacking the convoy. And this gives them a moment to have this big superhero entrance for Alice where she um, comes in and uh, uses her telekinetic powers to grab the flames from the flamethrower and spread it around the sky and kill all the birds, which we're going to see here in a minute. But it's just also one of those cosmic coincidences that Alice just happened to be right near the convoy. It's it's That's how Paul Anderson writes. He doesn't know how to do things where it's like someone something happens with a purpose. Um, like, I wouldn't say this is unorganic. It, it, it doesn't feel forced. So I got to give Russell Mulcahy and, and everyone who involved in these scenes that it doesn't feel forced that Alice is there, but it is a big cosmic coincidence that she would just be nearby um, and be able to walk to their convoy. Um, and I think they try to say like, oh, it's, she's just following the bird. She's wondering what's up with the birds. And they're not going to eat her because she's T-virus infected. So they're not attracted to her or wanting to eat her. This scene's neat, though. Uh, you have Betty there and she's the, the medic, someone they definitely need alive. And yet the team <laughs> didn't like LJ. Nobody like died trying to save her. It's like, dude, she's the medic of the group. Like she's more important than some of you um and this is her and i think eddie maybe i can't remember the name of the driver but she's betty but i think there's a guy in the group named eddie i can't remember um or Otto. Otto's the the guy at the front and they get left behind and she gets picked apart by the crows but it's it's a neat scene because like you 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 kind of want like oh you're gonna put the dog in the movie well i want to see the dog eat somebody oh you want to put the crows in the movie i want to see the crows eat somebody um it's kind of like well that's the purpose right like that's why you want them in in the movie so that they they're like a movie monster like jason or freddy or any of them you want them to have their moment too um so i kind of like that russell gave the crows their moment here um and this is something we've wanted to see since the first movie is people were like, oh, the crows. I want to see the crows. Um, so, yeah, here's Alice <laughs> saving everybody. Alice does is kind of a, a Mary Sue character. I know people don't like that term. I don't actually like to use that term, but she is. She's a, she has a character that is just kind of perfect, always knows what to do, always has the answers, always at the right place at the right time doesn't actually have to work for anything a lot of times i felt like in this movie there's a little bit of work for alice um her powers like right there boom it came at a price it knocked her out but it also she she used her powers knowing that it was going to reveal her location to umbrella um so so she just exposed herself so i kind of like that like i she made a choice like i want to save these people but in doing so I might lead Umbrella right to them and to us. Um, but she still makes the choice to do the right thing. And I think that I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's a character moment. It's a choice she had to make. But they don't really embellish on that choice too much. She just does it and it's it's over. And that's where she borderlines in this movie where I'm like, she could have been, if she admitted like, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I, I saved you, or I'm sorry, I saved you guys. And they they could be like, why are you sorry? Like, you, you saved us. Like, what do you mean you're sorry? And she's like, yeah, but because I use my powers, it may bring Umbrella here. She she doesn't admit that. Like, nobody admits the bad side of things. LJ doesn't admit that he's infected. Alice doesn't admit that she's going to be tracked somehow. Like, it's just, yeah. I think there's a little conversation between her and Claire, but not really. Claire is kind of standoffish with Alice at first. That was a character trait that was supposed to be given to Jill. Because, remember, Jill was with Alice when Angie died. So when Alice leaves and goes off on her own, Jill still hates Alice for killing Angie because that was also the little, that was a little girl they, they saved in the second movie. So it sucks this movie without Jill because you could have had real character development where Jill doesn't like Alice, but I think originally scripted Jill was going to, was going to die saving Alice. Um, so she was going to have a character arc. Like I hate Alice for what she did and everything like that. And then in this movie, something was going to happen to change that. I guess she was going to. Re she learns that Umbrella is controlling Alice's every action, and then she starts to forgive Alice. And then in turn, Jill was going to sacrifice her own life to save Alice. That's actually a neat character thing, and I'm very impressed 
from what I hear, I don't know if that was an actual script thing, but from what I understand about the first couple drafts of the script, that was supposed to be what happened. Um, I think that's actual character development and story arcs, and I'm very happy that Paul Anderson is capable of doing that, but when you watch his finished products, it doesn't seem like he's capable of doing that at all. Um, this is a uh, Kmart. Uh, she's a character who pops up in the fourth movie at the end, played by Spencer Locke. Um, but then never again mentioned because <laughs> that's what this movie franchise does. It introduces a young girl, um, for Alice to save and then forgets all about them in the next movie. So like in the third, the second movie apocalypse, it was Angie and this movie forgets Angie, but they bring in Kmart. And I like that because that was Kmart was supposed to be the bridge between Jill and, um, and, uh, Alice here. So I think there in the original script, there was a moment where Alice was going to save Kmart and show that she can fight the programming of Umbrella and that is what I think ultimately pushed Jill over the edge to or push Jill to the point to forgive Alice and then sacrifice her own life to save Alice so that Alice could defeat Umbrella um, so yeah that was originally like a plan there um, and it didn't happen because they couldn't get Jill for the movie so they just gave some of those characteristics to Claire for no reason so Claire has like this standoffish attitude with Alice at first and you're kind of like why is she like that but then but I, I but I guess they I think Ali Larder explained in an interview it's because Claire just lost people like she's in charge of this convoy she's the leader and she's only caused death so so they draw a parallel between her and Alice that's kind of their character arcs is Alice feels responsible for the friend she lost and so does Claire and I, I kind of like that. I mean, it's not bad to have a parallel, um, but I would have liked the Jill story better. But we have Carlos here, played by Oded Fair, um, who has a good moment coming up. They Instead of uh, Jill sacking, sacrificing her life to save everybody, or to save Alice and let her get a, you know get one step closer to defeating Umbrella, um, Oded Fair's character Carlos makes that sacrifice in this movie. So he's... Um, He's in, going to get infected and at some point. And, um, and as you know, they kind of built a relationship between him and um, Alice in the last movie. And so in this movie, they're playing that up, you know, where he's kind of happy to see her. And there might be a romantic connection there. Um, which is funny because in the fifth movie, I think they just straight up have her, uh, a clone of her, be married to uh, Carlos. And I'm like, does um, Umbrella... Carlos was a mercenary before all this world, before the world fell apart. Like, did they have Carlos's DNA on file? Like, <laughs> like, and where did they get his DNA? Because they never had him in their, in his captivity. And maybe when he signed up to be a mercenary for them, he had to do a blood test and they took a blood sample from him. I guess that's possible, but they don't explain that. So I, I win a no prize for connecting that dot. So yeah, so here we go. Boom. She revealed herself and now the satellites show. And look at his lip is sweating. You're kind of like, did you not want to do another take of that? Like, but I guess uh, Russell McKay was trying to go for authenticity on some level. Like, hey, this guy's in his office. It's underground. Bad ventilation maybe, which that's not good. You can't have bad ventilation when you're dealing with uh, viruses and stuff. <laughs> you want better ventilation. Um, but he's in there just sweating. Maybe he's an easy sweater. That's fine. I'm an easy sweater too. I could... I could watch someone peel an orange and I'll sweat, um, which is actually a joke from Kevin James, uh, that from one of his stand-ups, which I always love that joke. <laughs> um, so here we have the scene where Claire and Alice connect, and she says, "I love that line." She actually, Allie Larder nails it. She's like, yeah, uh, "Alice goes, yeah, all my friends are dead, and um, and I, everyone I'm around just ends up dying," and Claire goes, "Yeah, you're not the only one with that ability." And I'm like, oh, okay. This is, com you know, commonality. It's it's not bad. I just, I think I still would have preferred the um, Jill story. Um, but yeah, so here we have Isaacs talking to the hologram of Wesker. Wesker in this is the president of Umbrella. That is very different from the video games. Um, in the video games, Wesker hates Umbrella. Uh, he works for them. He worked for them since he was younger. Um, in the video games, I did a whole lore video on it on the Nemesis show. So if you want to go back and check it out, um, it's one of my earlier episodes. It's called Project W. 
it's in the first like 10 episodes of my show here um in project w it was umbrella finding a bunch of like really bright-minded young people who were really smart who were also orphaned and they took them in and there was 13 of uh, 13 of them i think and they all were basically groomed psychologically to um serve umbrella and serve um the ultimate goal which was to come up with something with using the progenitor virus which is the what the virus was called before it became the t virus they, they they wanted all 13 of these scientists to work on the virus and train them give them the best schooling give them everything and like i said groom them and kind of brainwash them um, to follow umbrella and their goal was to create a t virus or create a virus i should say that um would reverse the aging effects Oswell E. Spencer, the guy who actually runs Umbrella, the, the guy who created Umbrella along with them, um, he used the money from the Ashford family. He used some of their wealth to help kickstart Umbrella um, back in the 50s or 60s, I believe. And then he worked with a scientist named Dr. James Marcus who helped uh, discover the flower um, that existed in Africa that could bloom underground. So they found this underground cave and they found these flowers that were blooming without sunlight. They didn't need sunlight to bloom. And so from that flower, they create the progenitor virus. From the progenitor virus, they're able to create the T virus. So the plan was that these 13 scientists called the Project W, Project Wesker, they would all be given the last name Wesker, and uh, and they would work for Umbrella and be groomed by Umbrella and kind of not told about each other. So Umbrella would have like Alex Wesker work on an island, Albert Wesker work in Raccoon City. Um, and so I guess Wesker, Albert Wesker, he they started figuring this out. And he started building a resentment towards Umbrella and the programming that was being, uh, you know, forced into him. So in the first Resident Evil game, he decides, all right, I'm going to double cross Umbrella. Um, uh, now that this virus has leaked, I'm going to use this as my opportunity to um, go in there, get the combat data of what these monsters can do, take uh, you know samples of the virus, and bring it to a new employer and sell my soul to a new organization and a finally break free from the brainwashing that has been infecting me my, my whole adult life. And so Wesker was not really loyal to Umbrella at all. So in, so having him as the CEO of the, the Umbrella Corporation for the movies, it's just kind of funny. But they retconned that anyway because in the, in like the fifth movie uh, – or sixth movie, yeah, I think it's in the sixth movie, they bring back Ian Glenn back as Dr. Isaacs, and you find out that this Dr. Isaacs that's in this movie is actually a clone, uh, and he's not the real Dr. Isaacs, <laughs> and that, uh, and he's kind of like Project W, where there's a bunch of Dr. Isaacs, and they don't know about each other, so, so they kind of change the story there, and they do introduce Dr. Marcus in the, the sixth movie, but they say he created the T-Virus, which is true to the video game lore, he's one of those scientists that came up or he figured out from the progenitor virus how to create the T-virus using leeches. Um, but they already in the second movie established that Dr. Ashford was uh, one of the people who created the T-virus. So, yeah, so it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but this scene here where they're like, we're going to take this chance and we're going to all go um, and we're going to risk our lives, like we, we don't have a choice, you know. Um, and Claire's nervous because she just lost a lot of people and she knows she'll probably lose more but at the end they need hope and she's so she asked her team like hey you guys willing to take it on faith that there's a group in alaska that can save us and they're like yeah we we need it because we're running out of food and everything so with not much to go on they decide we're we're going to start heading to alaska and then now we have dr isaacs in his lab he recorded wesker saying a few things i thought this was kind of clever he needs wesker's um, voice to activate some kind of files on the computer um, to activate and send in a squad to to get Alice. And so um, that's what he does. So now Alice and her group, they're making their way through Nevada desert and they're coming up to Vegas. And you're going to see a lot of the Vegas Strip just buried underneath the sand, um, which again is a neat concept. It's a neat visual. But I also stand by what I said earlier. If you're going to make a movie that's that says in the beginning that the virus wiped out the planet and dried everything up, then I wouldn't have the movie set in the desert where it's already dried up. I would say like, Hey, look, this is Florida, you know, or this is Chicago. Um, 
uh, you know, where it's not dried up. <laughs> I just thought that would be better. Um, it, it just, I don't know. I, like creatively, I don't understand the point. So yeah, here's the convoy driving through the, the dirt. Like I said, I think they filmed some of this in Mexico. Yeah, and you have her looking through the journal again. The journal thing's a nice touch. It's from the game. Um, I like that in the game where you can learn more about the world of Resident Evil by reading people's journals. You'll read journals from scientists who were there when the outbreak happened, so they'll tell you how they got infected and that they're, they, they're afraid to die, and they talk about the loved ones they're leaving behind. And Then there's other ones where in Raccoon City where you're hearing about people who try to barricade the police station and work with police so they could stay safe, but then the zombies broke through anyway and killed all the police and bit them, and now they're dying, and they locked themselves in a room. And it's just, it's, it adds so much to those games to where you're like, you get a sense of how bad things got. Because, yeah, you can walk down the street and see zombies everywhere, and you're like, wow, things went to shit fast. But when you actually read files in the games that tell you the life stories of people who tried to prevent it or tried to stop the spread or fought with their life or gave up and they just got scared and are hiding in a room like you just read all these stories about people taking different paths and dealing with the the disaster in a different way and it just it adds something so I, I did like the the use of her flipping through the journal and seeing someone right in there like hey if we go up to Alaska and go to the sanctuary it's it's carefree living up there there's plenty of food uh, they got plenty of resources and the zombies can't survive in the snow or whatever. And it's like, oh, cool, cool. There's a plan. And it, it's so I kind of liked all that that they, they added in here. But then as you see in the next movie, they go up to like Alaska and then then they're like, all right, let's go down to L.A. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 the, the sanctuary is not an, uh, a place in Alaska. After all, it's a boat that's just going up and down the coast of the U.S., the West Coast of the U.S., which is a neat twist, but at the same time, it's like, oh, I would have liked to seen them fight zombies in the, or stay away from the snow, you know, like or uh, zombies staying away from them while they're up in the snow. But then they do that in the fifth movie, and the zombies are like swimming through ice water, like from the depths of the ocean, and they're swimming to the surface of the ocean to eat M Michelle Rodriguez <laughs> or her clone, uh, Rain's clone. So it's it's just funny. It's like again, Paul Anderson's like hey, we're going to say something in this movie. And then two movies later, we're going to do the exact opposite. Or one movie later, we're going to do the exact opposite. It's just uh, terrible. But look at him. He's clearly, something's going on with LJ. Like, he he doesn't just look tired. Uh, so I'm surprised right there he didn't just say, like, hey, man, look, I'm, I'm bit. And I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. I regret it. And I lost Betty. And I lost everything. And and I don't want to I don't want to be the reason you guys are hurt. So if you see me turn, take care of me. And then he could have said that there and redeemed his character. And then you could have had a scene where when um, uh, Chase, Lyndon Ashby's character, goes up to be the sniper. He's the only one who knows that, that LJ is infected. So he's like keeping an eye on LJ in his sniper rifle. And then maybe he has to look away from LJ to save someone else's life. And then because of that, LJ turns and bites uh, Carlos. Like, you could have added more drama and tension to these things. Um, but but they don't. It, it's so weird. I, you know, I'm not... And, I, of course, my ideas are just my opinions. So it's not like I'm giving actual ways to make the movie better. That's not it. I'm just saying what I would do in that in this situation. Um and of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's easy to watch something and say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And sometimes hard to come up with that beforehand. So I totally get that. I'm not I'm not here to like just tear these filmmakers and people who worked really hard on this movie apart or anything. But I just uh I just still like even in the editing room, like you're I'm like, God, God even after you film the movie, it's like, can we not do a pickup shot with LJ sitting in a truck and then intersplice it with shots of Lyndon Ashby in a truck from that we were filmed earlier and actually have LJ confess this. Like it seems like one of those things where it's like, that's what reshoots and pickups are for where it's like you watch the footage and go, Oh yeah, that's what I, let's do this, you know? And then you try to make it happen. Um, and sometimes you can't make it happen. So maybe they did try and they, they couldn't, but it's just one of those things where I, it's like, yeah, do these movies need to be works of art and, and brilliantly written? No, but do they have to be so poorly written and executed? Also? No. Uh, there is a middle ground between these movies and 
Oscar material. <laughs> you know, like you can, there's a great middle ground where this movie can exist, where all the Resident Evil movies can exist, where you actually have characters with motivation and uh, reasons for doing things that aren't just surface level crap. Um, and even your background characters, you can give them a moment to have something, you know, um, and they, they just don't do it. Um, these zombies here, these super zombies, as you saw earlier when they were in the lab, um, you know, he was trying to put the pieces in the, the shape box and then he got frustrated and got up and killed the scientists. So these zombies, now that they've been infected with Alice's blood, I think it was, um, they're like super zombies. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're pretty pathetic. I don't know how Umbrella got them all dressed in the same mechanic gear. Like they have like these, uh, like, you know, mechanics clothes on, um, did someone dress all of these naked zombies? Like it's, it, I don't know. Um, I just think it's funny that they're all dressed alike. Uh, this idea though came, it's kind of a little bit inspired by the Crimson Head zombies in the Resident Evil 1 remake, which came out obviously a few years before this movie did. They introduced the Crimson Head zombies, which were only in surprisingly the first remake. I, I thought when they were remaking Resident Evil 2 and 3 that they were going to add Crimson Head zombies. In three, they added they added tentacle zombies, which it, it makes a little bit of sense because if they were infected by Nemesis, Nemesis is derived from the parasite, I believe, um, from a parasite. They don't say which one. They name it, but it's it, Nemesis could potentially be linked parasitically to the uh, um, Las Plagas. Kind of, he could be a derivative of it, like an uh, like someone brought it into a science lab and manipulated it and, and that's what came up with uh with that actually what they did was they they had a parasite thing they injected it into lisa trevor and then her body ate up the parasite and created a new chemical which ended up being the basis for the g virus that william birkin worked on but i think that same parasite was put into a test subject in europe in umbrella europe's facility and they became the the nemesis so um so in the Resident Evil 3 remake video game, they do tentacle monsters. But the Crimson Heads never showed back up, and I really like the Crimson Head zombies. They're, they're really cool looking. Um, and uh, and so I think this was their way of going, hey, let's do a couple super zombies, and we'll tie it into Day of the Dead, and we'll just make them turn into super zombies. Because in Day of the Dead, I think Buck maybe was, or Bud, Bud? I can't remember, the, the, zomb the, the smart zombie in... Day of the Dead. I can't remember his name right now. He, um, they're like, say hello to your Aunt Alicia. Like they gave him a phone. They're like, say hello to your Aunt Alicia. And he's like, oh, oh Aunt Alicia. <laughs> and you're like, holy cow, these things still have humanity in them. But they obviously went the opposite direction in this movie. And they had, um, they had the zombies turn into super zombies. Um, and then Alice just goes around killing them all. And they still lose like, you know, half their convoy again. So just proven that Claire, Claire and, uh, and Alice just got more people killed, basically. Um, uh, if you're wondering why Mila Jovich is dressed like a weirdo in this movie, it's because she designed her own costume. I think in the second movie she did the same thing where she had like that mesh fishnetty type uh, material on top of a tank top and stuff and like jeans with like one thigh exposed or something. I don't know. She had her own, I think she might still own this company. I can't remember. She has her own clothing line because obviously she has a supermodel background and uh, she has her own clothing line called Jovovich Hawk and they did her wardrobe. And I think a couple of the other characters, I want to say maybe Claire and someone else they did wardrobe for, but uh, yeah, that's why she looks like, <laughs> like a total weirdo. <laughs> um, It's hard because you're like, okay, the whole planet's a desert, so you don't you want to dress for those conditions, but then you also want to dress for the conditions that there are zombies and crows that can infect you. So it's like, all right, am I going to just dress in heavy clothes and and prevent myself from getting eaten, but I'll sweat my balls off every day, or you know, because all these people they probably smell like like ten day old rotten ass, uh, probably a hundred day old rotten ass. Like there's there's no way these people are hygienically like it's not good for them. Uh, I'm surprised half of them don't have the flu. <laughs> um, Cause just 
they're not finding a lot of places with running water. That should have been a scene maybe before this where they're like, hey, this place actually has running water. And then so they're like, all right, we're going to, you know, go one at a time. Like everyone showers one at a time. Um, that could have been something they could have done. But again, those little things don't really make or break a movie. They're little nitpicky things for sure. But, um, you know, all these people just look really, really beautiful for being out on the road for all this time. Um, but there is the guy who was kind of a love interest to Claire. Uh, she kind of smiled at him earlier, earlier, and you know now Alice is she's been programmed again, but now she can just magically fight the programming, like out of nowhere. So this is where I say that she's kind of a, a Mary Sue. She's not. They're just saying like, oh my God, she's fighting the program. It's like, but how? Like how is she? It'd be one thing if like her eyes, because her eyes are open, they should show you her perspective, like her seeing her friends dying like she should be watching this happening like her eyes should see him dying her eyes should see the guy that claire was trying to save die uh, maybe she sees carlos get bit i think if she if she was seeing those and her brain was registering it and that was clear to the audience then that would be the reason she's fighting so again little minor things could have changed parts of this movie little minor things like you don't think about that you're like oh i don't care that she's fighting oh and then i bring it up and you're like oh well okay well how could she fight it how do you show that she's fighting it and like i said you just have her where she's standing still and she's like this she's staring up at the sky you can't she's not really seeing what's going on down below but if you had her stop and staring down and she could see everyone dying and you show it from her perspective and she's watching people die you can have her do this here where she sends her telekinetic powers all the way to space, I guess, and damages a, a chip in the satellite so she can't be controlled anymore. But it would give her motivation to do it. Like, I, I, you could argue the motivation is there, and that is what's happening, but the movie doesn't show or tell you that. So. So, yeah. So you don't know. See, like, right now, like, she, she, she looked down to see those two super zombies eating somebody. Um, she wasn't already looking at the carnage. And it's funny, for rated R movies, they do hide a, some of the gore sometimes. Like earlier you saw an actual decapitated head next to her, but in that scene, when she jumped by them, they didn't have the zombies' heads just fall off. That would have, you know. But sometimes when you do rated R stuff, they give you a limit. They're like, all right, here's how many heads you can decapitate. Here's how many Here's how many nipples you can show. Here's how many F-words you can say before it becomes NC-17. Um, so... <laughs> I like that these guys are still dressed in motorcycle gear even during the apocalypse. Like I said, you have to make these decisions. You're like, do we, um, you know, do, like, what, what do we do? Do we dress for, uh, do we dress for the weather or do we dress for combat? Because, <laughs> because uh, dressing for combat is going to make the, the weather situation suck. Like, that's why her legs with her, her thighs exposed, you're like, all right, that's not smart for zombie stuff because sometimes she'll even wrap her legs around a zombie's head and break their neck and they're like why would you do that with like your legs exposed they could just bite your inner thigh but i guess alice doesn't care uh, she doesn't care about that because she's already infected so it's not a big deal but so alice is like hey look they got away on a short range helicopter um we don't we don't need the convoy to get to alaska now and since co conveniently there's only five of us left because we just got everyone killed. I guess we'll just take their helicopter. <laughs> like, it's so bad. It's like, um, but also like Dr. Isaac. So he's been infected. He, he got bit, obviously. And now he's just overloading himself with serum. So he's taken too many antidotes. So he's like, yeah, I got bit, and it, because it was a super zombie, they have a irritated version of like the T virus, right? So, um, so a, a regular, uh, he's like, I injected myself, and it didn't um, reverse the effects. Like I got back in time, um, but then now he's starting to lose it, and he's now just injecting himself over and over and over. So his uh, his right hand man, his star scream here is like, all right, here's my opportunity. You've lost it. And now I can kill you. 
and uh, and take over your job. And I, this is actually one of the most Resident Evil things <laughs> in this movie because that's what happens in the games. Wesker and Birkin, they kill uh, Marcus and take over his research. This guy, Slater, is like, all right, I'm going to kill Isaacs and take over his research. But too late. He's already changed. But at least the Slater had the balls to shoot the guy himself. Um, whereas Wesker and Birkin, they let like two hunk dressed agents do it and kill Marcus. Cowards. So yeah, so now they've said somehow they've managed to get all the way to this close, get on the mountain there, and attract zero zombies to them. All the zombies are still there, smelling people that are miles underground, but they can't smell people that are standing above ground miles behind them. <laughs> um, but this, I think, was originally going to be close to the scene where Jill was going to sacrifice herself. Either it was here or in the lab, I can't remember. And again, I, I don't even know the full details. I haven't actually read an early draft of the script, obviously. Um, there is a draft of the script that's out there you can read that's just this version, like the you know the version they shot. There's some differences, but not not a ton. Um, and I think that was the script that probably the writer of the novel had to go off of when he had to write his novel. I like the DA and the novel try to add some backstory. He try to fill in the gap of the five years and explain some of the things. But um, I wish the filmmakers would do that a little bit. I wish they added a little bit more. Um, cause you have Carlos coming up on this big decision where he's, he's going to sacrifice his life so the others can live and everyone's crying and they're sad that he's leaving. And you're kind of like, uh, yeah, I guess we know him from the last movie, but you don't, I don't know. I didn't feel too attached. I love Oded Fair, but I didn't feel like super attached to Carlos enough to where I was like, Oh, Carlos, don't do this. You know, I, at least I didn't feel that way, but I'm sure there are fans out there that did. But I like Oded Fair a lot. He's so talented. And I, I love him in The Mummy. And I, I love, he's been in a lot of stuff. Been on various TV shows. He's really good. And even though he's not like, I don't know, he wouldn't, wouldn't have been my choice for Carlos. Um, he still plays a, the character well, like I, I feel. Like he has a little bit of a heart to him. Um, And I think he's one of those actors that he got this script and was like, I'm going to do the best I can with it. Um, even though there's not a ton there, I'm going to just, because these movies eventually, they just became fun. It was like reunions, like family reunions. You know how you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Myrtle Beach for my family reunion. You guys just kind of fuck off and just hang around and just do random things and uh, get into random fun. Um, that's kind of what this these movies became. It was just like a family reunion. Everyone would just kind of hang out and they were just happy to work together and still have work and jobs. And, and it was like fun to come back to this with like, Oh, we get to come back to the Resident Evil world. It's like, like I said, it was like a reunion and, uh, and it became so much about that and less about the actual storytelling. So each movie became, Hey, which friends from previous movies can we get to come back to play with us again? And it became more about that and less about actually writing good stories. And, uh, and that's why I don't really like, like the first three movies, there are things in them I like and things I, I don't, obviously. Um, but uh, I understand some of the some things in them. This one is start where it starts to lose me a lot, where I, I start to no longer understand why they make certain decisions. But four, five, and six are just a nightmare. Like four I, is a guilty pleasure. I, I, I like watching that one the same way I like watching Batman and Robin. Like there's enough goofiness in it to where I kind of laugh and get a little bit of mystery science theater 2000 joy out of it but five and six uh i think it's a uh, what is it retribution and the final chapter just man wait till we get to those commentaries i don't know if i'll say anything negative negative. and those are the movies like i said where we had one stunt woman have her arm taken off in a stunt and then one uh, who died um just shitty filmmaking on every level those movies Carlos found LJ's last blunt. I kind of like that moment because it was set up. I, you know me, I like setups and payoffs. It's it's kind of a a standard for movies you're supposed to do. But again, just because there are rules to filmmaking doesn't mean you have to follow them. That's also what's great about art is that you can, 
interpret things and do things your own way. But um, but this movie is one of those where I'm like, wow, there was a setup and a payoff. Look at that. <laughs> um, I can't remember if they said someone could fly the helicopter, but I wish they would have said that. And that way, that person they could have protected. Like if Claire was like, I can fly the chopper, which I guess she can. But um, but it's like, yeah, they would have focused a little bit more on that. Like, like she's like, everyone's like, all right, keep you know, keep an eye on Claire because we're gonna need her. I like this too. She hands Spencer Lock uh, Kmart. She hands her the the book. And she kind of signal she signals to Claire because, like I said, originally that was going to be Jill, or but I guess she already made the uh, Jill. I think would have been dead by this point in the movie. So she looks at Claire and is like, "Hey, look, you look, you you did it. You saved some people. Now go now go be with others. Like I know we, you know, kind of like there's a lot in that look. She's kind of like she salutes her and she's like, "Yeah, we're cursed. We, we couldn't get everybody here, but we got some people here. So get them out of here. And I'm gonna go make the heroic sacrifice and and destroy." this last group of umbrella that we know about, because obviously she's going to learn about Wesker and all them too. Um, when she goes down into the lab, but, uh, this could have been a good ending. Um, if they, if they did the Jill thing and they could change some of the stuff around, but because they couldn't, and because Paul Anderson can't help himself, I think even if they did get Jill in this, he still would have ended this movie on a cliffhanger because that guy does, he doesn't know how to not do that. Mortal Kombat one ends on a cliffhanger. Um, I think Event Horizon, I think that has an ending, but there's also like a, I don't know, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've seen that one. But I, a lot of his movies, he just, because he likes Omega Man, he likes movies like that. He's like, he's like, yeah, let's uh, let's end on a cliffhanger because maybe someone could come back. Maybe we could do this again. And ugh. So we have another giant ass laboratory, which for some reason under this one doesn't house a bunch of billionaires. Um, even though it's very similar to the, uh, um, previous lab, the hive in raccoon city and look, that elevator didn't go down all the way. It still could go down further. So I guess there could have been other executives down there. I think that's where the clones are though. I think they established that later. This scene here is nice because this reminds me a lot of the first Resident Evil game. The, the way that light is on the wall back there um, reminds me of the first, the remake of Resident Evil 1 with the some of the lab lights. And then her walking around just like a completely dark corridor. Like I actually really like how this stuff is shot. This, this uh, feels very Resident Evil to me. Um, she grabs the flashlight and uses it to look around. Um... I mean, again, like this, this feels very Resident Evil to me. And she, she's a little scared, you know, um, which is nice to see with the character. She, she has an emotion. <laughs> Sometimes with Alice, she just looks like she's ready to kick everyone's ass. But right here, she's like, I have no idea what's going on. And, uh, but it's weird. She didn't even flinch at that. I kind of wish she did. She's still human. Like I know she has superpowers, but she should still act human. And she does at times, but she just, they're not consistent with it. But that like flash that could have been added in post, you know, just to brighten up the scene or something, or add something to the scene, because because if a light went off that close to her face, even a practical effect, she would have reacted in some way. But she she didn't. She just stood there and kept walking. So I don't know. It could have been a digital effect. So here we have Alice meeting the White Queen, because obviously the umbrella logo has red. Uh, triangles in it and white because I think in the original there was going to be there's red umbrella and white umbrella that was something that was set up in some of the novels I think by S.D. Perry um, so there's a red queen and a white queen because like I said Paul Anderson can't help himself he has to keep bringing back things he's already done and then he has to do things that other people has done and then you realize his movie is full of things that aren't actually original anymore <laughs> um because even in the first movie, he's like, I'm going to make the Red Queen. She's going to say, you know, cut off their heads. That's all from Alice in Wonderland. And my main character's name is Alice. So it's just everything is borrowed from this guy. And he he doesn't... Uh, I think the most original movie he made was Mortal Kombat because he didn't take a lot of influences 
from things outside of Mortal Kombat. Like he, the movie is very much based on Mortal Kombat, and that's why he got this job to make Resident Evil. But he, after the first, even in the first movie, he was referencing Omega Man and all these other movies. So you're just like, okay, and Cube, and so you're like, okay, dude, you, <laughs> you, you don't even want to make Resident Evil movies. You just want to make remakes of Omega Man and and Cube, apparently. But so here we have, so where Alice just learns information, she just gets told it. Like, it's just like, she comes down here and she doesn't gradually learn that there's a Dr. Isaac's tyrant monster. Um, the White Queen tells her, yeah, he's, I've isolated him. I've isolated him to this side of the lap, you know, like, so I'm going to, I'm going to lead you there and you're going to go in and kill him. And it's like, like, can, can these characters not do anything without it being told to them first like let her see this is just like the scene when she first showed up and she's walking through looking around the darkness you could have just instead of had her go into the lab and meet the white queen you could have co completely written out the white queen completely she's just there to be reference that's it um and then they bring the red queen back i think in the sixth movie pretty much just so Mila Jovovich's daughter could be in it but and that's fine i mean that's i'm not upset by that but that's what I mean by these movies just becoming a family reunion. They just, that's what they became after a while. Um, so like, oh, we want our daughter in this movie. Well, okay, well, let's just make her the Red Queen. And it's like, oh, why don't you make her an original character? <laughs> like, why don't you come up with a different character for her to be? Um, yeah. But yeah, you could have easily cut out that scene that we had before. Look at that. Everyone's impaled. It's pretty crazy that Dr. Isaacs went and did all this um, and just like brutally murdered everybody like this. That would have been a great scene to see, right? A tyrant just going through and just tearing everyone up. So why would Dr. Isaacs tear everyone up like this but not rip an Alice clone out of her liquid bubble and kill her? Like why would he stop like at just killing the scientists? And it's because so Alice can find the clone <laughs> also how do you get a a giant drop of water to just hover into in space like this <laughs> um who cares you're asking too many questions seek looks like there could have been another clone back there there looks like another machine that could have held a clone but then that would have been neat if she looked on the floor and saw the dead body of the clone and then um Uh, you know, and then and, and the puddle of water everywhere, but no, they didn't do that. Oh, she caught herself. So he's supposed to kind of be a tyrant. One of the thing I think the feedback from the fans of the first movie were like, hey, you know, some people were like, hey, we like this, but you didn't give us a tyrant. And then in the second movie, they did Nemesis, um, which doesn't feel like an evolution of a tyrant. That's kind of the thing about Nemesis is that in the first video game you had a tyrant and the second one you had a Mr. X, which was like a more controlled version of a tyrant. And then the third movie, in the third game you had Nemesis. So there was a progression. The movies didn't do that. There was a liquor in the first movie. Um, and then I guess it evolved into a, a different liquor, a, a super liquor. Um, but then they just jump right to Nemesis. So now this feels like a downgrade because this guy is not nearly as neat as Nemesis. So it's like a step back. That's why I was hoping the ending would be like an Alexia Ashford type, you know, a bug lady. And then Paul Anderson could have went crazy with his res uh, with his uh, aliens references because he could have been like, oh, look, Alice has to fight the queen. And the queen is Angie, you know, turned into a monster or whatever. And But she can still save Angie, maybe. But she's got to like, you know, give her give up herself or inject Angie with Alice DNA or, I don't, you know, they could have done something. I'm just throwing random stupid ideas out. But so now we're back in the mansion. Uh, they recreated the set. This is not, because in the first movie they went to Germany and filmed the mansion. This is a set that's a duplicate. It's, it's a replica build. They had a little bit more money in this movie. So they're able to make this scene. But yeah, so he's supposed to be a tyrant. I think he has a name. I think in the script they refer to him as Rancid. I think. 
Um, so he's like a rancid slash tyrant. But uh, he's got tentacles that that are taking their time for no reason. They're just hovering in front of Alice's face, waiting to stab her. Ooh. Boom. But see, she still it still hurts her to use the power. So I, I kind of like that. I think Russell Mulcahy was probably like, there's got to be, like he seems like one of those kind of directors where he's like, there. if you're going to use your power, it should hurt. It should come at a cost. Otherwise, you're just like a Mary Sue. <laughs> um, I like that he has the, the scream of Black Bolt from uh, Inhumans <laughs> for no reason. Um, that would have been another good twist is that I think there was a lot of rumors that Alice was going to be a villain at one point in one of these movies and that could have been something where they made her like into a an Alexia Ashford type because they gave her the powers of Alexia at the end of the second movie and in this movie she used them where she can telekinetically affect people you know and, and move things around and I, that could have been a neat evolution you know, where she's, you know, turns into something. Oh. I think a different actor... I think a different actor plays the actual rancid tyrant. Um, I think Ian Glenn plays maybe him on the close-ups with makeup, but I think there's someone else doing all the other stuff. I think his name is Steel. His last name is Steel. S T E E L E. S T E E L E. So yeah, she's so like, so she I guess can see the into the mind of the other Alice. So she knew that this was coming, I guess. But then she acts shocked when the laser stops. It's like, well, if you knew the other Alice, because she's like, we're both gonna die down here. I'm like, yeah, but you need someone to turn the hallway on. Like the hallway isn't just gonna turn on. And then do he does the cube thing all over again. Yeah, but that would have been a cool shot to show Alice her eyes get wide and she can see through the eyes of the other Alice. And then that's how she knows that the machine's going to get turned on. Like, again, little little things like that. Not necessary. They don't make or break the movie, but just they would have, they add some things. They add things sometimes. Um, so here we're cutting to Tokyo. And this is obviously where we're going to reveal where Wesker is. He's the head of Umbrella. For some reason, it's a Japanese company run by an American um, I guess but then you find out in like the fifth or sixth movie that it's just one of many umbrella facilities well, I mean you kind of learn that here it's like look at all these board members but if Raccoon City was like the main hub why isn't Wesker in Raccoon City because that's where he ends up in the fifth and sixth movie oh in the fifth movie he's in Washington DC for no reason and then in the sixth movie he's back in Raccoon City for no reason Yep, so that's her being like, hey, F, fuck faces. <laughs> I was going to abbreviate fuck, I don't know why. Um, but she's like, hey, I'm coming for you. And so again, Paul Anderson is going like, yeah, let's end on this kick-ass high note where Alice has other Alices, and now there's an army of Alices, and it's, it's just crazy. It's like, if, if their plan this whole time was to, hey, we're going to create a virus, it's going to infect the entire planet, and then we're just going to wait out the apocalypse. But they have no safety net for the virus itself. Like the, It's like, why would you release a virus? They had the antidote, sure, but the antidote wasn't 100%. Gonna, like, it wasn't 100%. Um, so, like, why wouldn't they have a backup plan uh, at all? They're just like, we're going to infect the whole world, and then we're just going to um, let it eat itself, and then in, like, 50 years, we're going to wake up from cryostate and just rebuild and it and it's like you're gonna have a bunch of one percenters rebuild like none of them know anything about manual labor <laughs> for the most part i mean maybe a few of them got rich by starting out small but chances are not like it's it's it just it i don't the plan doesn't make any sense at all um and why have other dr isaac clones out there 
just doing whatever the hell they want? Why have Wesker above ground doing whatever the hell he wants? Like, why have any of that? Why not just hide underground, wait it all out? Like, you know, I don't know, whatever. I guess you have to have someone guard the raccoon facility, but that was nuked in the first movie, and then they bring it back in the sixth one, and it makes no sense that it's back. Um, I don't know. Because even, even if they were miles and miles underground, the, the blast effect that happens on land where it makes that big crater in Raccoon City, those effects, those ripple effects, would have eventually cascaded underground at some point. Um, so, I don't know. Whatever. So, um, or, I'm, I'm, I'm nitpicking just like the worst. <laughs> oh, we just saw uh, Charlie Clouser, who does the music for this. I think he's from Nine Inch Nails. Um, and Patrick Totopoulos, his studio does a lot of the uh, design and stuff for this. I saw his name's popped up recently because a lot of uh, Snyder Cut, released the Snyder Cut fans for Zack Snyder's Justice League movie. Um, the, a lot of them have uh, have been saying, oh my God, Patrick Totopoulos is working on um, uh, something. He's, he got announced for something. He's working on something else that's, that the, I think... I can't remember. He got announced for a new movie, and everyone's excited. All the Snyder Cut fans were excited because he worked on Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. But Patrick Chitopoulos, he also worked on this movie. Um, he worked on, um, I think, Underworld. I think he did all the werewolf stuff and vampire stuff on Underworld, his studio. That was the first time I ever heard his name. And I saw a behind-the-scenes thing where him and his team were working on stuff for Underworld. and um, So he's had actually a really good career. He he's, does good work. I'm, I'm not here to slam the guy. He actually does... Topless does really good work. He eventually he started out as like a, I think on the smaller end, just like working his way up through the the uh, you know, design and monster and creature design. Like he worked his way up through that, and then eventually created his own studio. Like pretty awesome. That's it's, it's like that's insanely awesome. The guy's very talented, um, but he has made movies that aren't great. But I think his work even in those movies have been good. Like I'm not a big Man of Steel or Batman v Superman fan. Um, Although I do like Zack Snyder's other work. Every, it's funny. Every time I say, oh, I don't like Zack Snyder's DC stuff, everyone goes, you're just a hater. And I'm like, yeah, but I love Dawn of the Dead. I love 300. I love Watchmen. And I even kind of like Sucker Punch a little bit. Um, so I'm not I'm not actually a hater of his at all. <laughs> I just don't like his DC stuff. Um, but uh, but even in those movies, like I recognize the, you know, the stuff. There is stuff I like in those movies a lot. So, And Patrick's work is really great. So yeah, we're we've been into the end credits here for a while now. I don't know what songs are playing. I can't, I can't remember the the names of some of them. I knew the first two soundtracks really well, but the third soundtrack um I don't really know that well. Um I think in the th- I can't remember. I think the third soundtrack had rock bands on. I know the first two did. I think the third one might have did, but I think from 4, 5 and 6 each soundtrack I think had one song by a band. I think it was like Deftones in the fourth movie. Uh, maybe or maybe they were the fifth movie um but there's like there was like one song for each movie and then um just you know i guess score music i guess i think tom and andy did the fourth movie so we'll get into that i mean this is our big finale this is uh our uh, you know i wanted it in my venom vlog shows i do 150 episodes per season i didn't want to get that detailed this for this show um so this is the end of season one this is episode 50 and usually what i do at the end of a season is i take like a week off before I start the next season, but I don't know if I'll take a whole week off. I might actually start getting back into Resident Evil videos very soon. I know I'm going to stream Resident Evil 4, so if you're listening to this, uh, make sure you stay subscribed to this channel because until I beat it, you know, hopefully it's Saturday night when I'm recording this right now, uh, January 24th, 2021. So on the 25th, I'll be playing Resident Evil 4 on on this channel. Uh, It won't be a Nemeseek episode. It'll just be a a live stream, a Spitting Venom you know, live stream. So uh, we're going to keep playing the uh, the game, the Resident Evil 4, because Resident Evil 8 l- looks so much like it, and they have a lot of assets that I'm pretty sure are going to get reused for a Resident Evil 4 remake. So I want to start talking about those, uh, even including Tall Lady. There's a, a character everyone's going gaga over right now called Tall Lady from Resident Evil 8. Um, there's a tall guy in Resident Evil 4, <laughs> and uh, he's a... Uh, kind of like the watches over the village and stuff he's like this big guy with a beard and he's like a smart tyrant basically and that's kind of what 
this tall lady is from uh, the new game. So I want to talk about all the comparisons. So we're going to have fun. We're going to play Resident Evil 4, which is something I haven't streamed on my YouTube channel before. So if you actually go back and look at my Resident Evil playlists, you won't see a playlist. Or you won't see a, a playthrough of 4. So, um, so I think it's a good time to do it now. So we'll probably do that. And then after I finish that playthrough, we'll get back to making Resident Evil videos. So it may still be me taking a week off. But during that week, I'll at least be playing the game, and we can talk Res Evil stuff there if you guys ever want to. And here, yeah, here's Searchlight with Contagious, Emigrate, uh, the song My World, so that showed you some of the some of the soundtracks there. And they also mentioned the Pocket Books novelization of this movie. So, uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, this movie came out in 2007, and it's not a huge pile of crap, but it's, it's I definitely don't like a lot of it, and I don't understand... Um, I don't understand a lot of the uh, decisions made in it, but I understand more about some of the decisions made in this movie than I do of any of the other ones we're going to talk about. So next season, hopefully in the span of that 50 episodes, by the way, we're back on the title screen, the menu screen now. So the episode, the movie should be over for you. So thank you for making it through all the way. If you listen to this all the way through, I appreciate it. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't understand four five and six. Like, there's so many things so next season somewhere between episode 51 and 100 um, I'll try to get through the commentary tracks of all three of those movies and then probably when we do season three of this show um, which will be episodes 101 to um, 150 we'll probably do the CG animated movies in that span um, and hopefully the live action, the new live action reboot movie, hopefully that'll be out in that time too. Because if you look, I mean, it, how we went through the first 50 episodes of the season really quickly. <laughs> and I imagine with Resident Evil 8 coming up and all these other things, I imagine we're going to get um, a lot of content on this show, hopefully, with all the live action Netflix series, the CGI Netflix series, the live action movie, like uh, the games. You know, I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of content on this channel. And actually, whenever I do podcasts like this, when Res Evil Reverse comes out, um, the new game, I'm going to be beta testing it actually next week. I don't know if they're going to let me record it or not, but I'll, you know, I'll ask. I'll see what the rules are. Um, but if I can, sh sh you know, record some of that footage for you guys and make a video for you and talk about my experience uh, playing it, I will. But when that game comes out, I think I'll be playing that a lot. Actually, if any of you out there are interested in Reverse and you want to play online multiplayer with me, we might start building a community where we do that, where you guys can join join me on PlayStation. You can join the chat. We'll all link together on a you know voice chat on PlayStation, and we can play through that game and have fun and just kind of talk about Res Evil. So that might be something we open up um, next season on this show and do them as Nemesis episodes. Um, we'll see. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, we'll see how short we are on content. If I need more content, then yeah. But there's also a ton of Res Evil lore, so I might make some more lore videos next season as well. So, um, yeah, so that's it. I, you know, it's about an hour and 42 minutes now. And, uh, and I appreciate you guys listening to this whole thing if you did, or if you listen to it in spurts. So, you know, uh, I can't imagine most of you listened to it all at once, but if you did and you did it while the movie was on, you know, let me know your thoughts. I want to hear what do you think of this movie, Resident Evil Extinction. Uh, let me know in the comments down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. And if you have any things you want to suggest for next season, you know, let me know. Let me know that in the comments too. If you have a couple of ideas that you'd like to see me try to do, uh, whether it's a type of video or a, to a particular topic, you know, whatever it is, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and then, like I said, I'll try to get through the the last three Paul Anderson movies in commentaries. We'll try to do those next season as well. We'll spread them out, um, but we'll we'll probably make final chapter episode 100. <laughs> and because I have a feeling I'm gonna just be a, a in a very bad mood while I watch that movie, and I might even drink something alcoholic <laughs> while I watch that movie. Because man, is it bad. Um, so anyway, thank you guys so much. I really do appreciate all the love and support for 50 episodes now. I'm so glad I finally got to make a Resident Evil show that lasted this long and we're just getting started. So we're going to have a lot more episodes to come in the future and I hope you guys stay along for that ride. Thank you so much. See you in the future. Peace.